not only from the fact that I haven't taught in three years, <laughs> but the subject matter too. And I would like to ask if you all have any questions, if you'd hold off and, and um, ask them at the end. Uh, also, I'm going to be moving pretty fast, so if you want to just write down the scriptures, uh, references to look up later and mark in your Bible, do so. I have some questions for you. And I would like to see how many of us have battled this. And knowing that we're not alone is often the first arrow in our quiver. So I would like for us to be transparent, if we will, for a moment. If you're willing, please raise your hand. If you have ever been in such a dark place that you thought about killing yourself. Thank you. Have you ever thought that you were so done with everything in your life that you just wanted to go to bed and never wake up? Have you ever been so angry or hurt by someone you love that you thought that they would be happier if you'd never been born? Have you ever cried out to the Lord to take you home because you were just so tired of the pain? Have you ever thought, I don't want to live in a world like this? Thank you for your transparency. Obviously, today I want to talk about suicide. I believe just about everyone considers it at one time or another, but no one is willing to talk about it. And you could have knocked me down last Sunday when Josh mentioned suicide twice in his message. The medical community would have us to believe depression is the cause of suicidal ideations, and you're labeled mental if you have given it serious consideration. I believe it's an evil spirit, and it can be passed down from generation to generation. Brother Ken told me of a young man he knows whose father killed himself, and immediately the son had an overwhelming urge to kill himself. When the spirit left him, the father, it entered him. I also believe that the root is a spirit of rejection, and its ultimate intention is to make you kill yourself. That is one of the reasons why we are commanded to forgive. When someone refuses to forgive, it opens the door for all sorts of evil to come in. Spirits of sadness, resentment, bitterness, self-pity, anger, hatred, and murder. They, in turn, all work together to destroy the life in you so that the spirit of death can prevail. The devil cannot kill you, but he can sure talk you into doing it yourself. I'm sure most of you have heard me say that not every voice in your head is your own. And I'm sure many of you have even had a thought of, where did that thought come from? Well, we all have spirits talking to us throughout the day and night. And if you're seeking the Lord while reading your Bible, the Holy Spirit may convict you of a sin that you committed years ago, but never dealt with. Or the devil might start rehashing an argument you had with somebody and begin condemning you for what you said, there is a fine line between conviction and condemnation, and they are often confused. One is designed to clean you up, draw you to God, and the other is to pull you down and drive you further into darkness. One shows the goodness of God, the other the despicably evil ways of our enemy. Little by little, his whole intent is to take you out, either by taking your life or turning you away from the Lord and using you up till there's nothing left but an empty shell. In my 70 plus years, I have never known such a time of death by suicide. I personally know of three suicides in the last six months. Even a couple of weeks ago, we had a church-wide email asking for prayers for a family from another church who had come home from church to find their 30-year-old daughter had killed herself. And by all reports, the numbers are increasing. We are grieved when death visits those we know and love by natural or unnatural causes. Nothing, however, is more heartbreaking than when, when someone takes his own life. Yet the world has often glamorized the act. Books, poetry, plays, and movies have romanticized the deed and made it appealing. 
nothing could be further from the truth. The devil is behind the act of suicide, no matter how it's accomplished. The Bible in John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He is called the thief because he steals life. Mark has been teaching on knowing the voices that you're listening to, the Holy Spirit or the enemies, and he pointed out a couple of weeks ago that the Holy Spirit voice is the still small voice. I today want to school you on the enemy's voice. When you're familiar with his voice, you are less apt to be taken in by his ways. Knowing his ways is adding more ammunition to your arsenal. I believe in being prepared. The word says in 1 Peter 5.8, Be sober, be vid vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is a liar, and even when he's not roaring, his tone is accusatory. He will never paint God in a good light. He always casts doubt on the Father's integrity. He's the one whispering in your ear, you should kill yourself. And then he gives you many reasons. The Holy Spirit will be countering with scriptures. Jesus died for you. Then the enemy will cast doubt again. Do you think for a moment that you will know who's talking to you? For he sounds so believable. He's an expert. That's why even Eve succumbed to his lives. Matthew 24, 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The scripture shows all of us, pastors, apostles, prophets, ministers included, are capable of being deceived by the enemy. We are actually believing we are talking to ourselves. Second Chronicles 18, 18 through 22 uh, is proof of a lying spirit. And I'm quoting, it says, again, he said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake, saying, after this manner, and another saying, after that manner. Then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his, all of his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. And if you've not read that, I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It's a real eye-opener. John eight forty four says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's what a suicidal spirit does. It lies to you and tries to steal your hopes and dreams and cause you to kill yourself and destroy your family. The enemy is darkness and his intent is to keep us in darkness. And the only hope is the light of the world, Jesus Christ. He is light and he is life. The New Testament teaches us to keep our eyes on Jesus. When we seek him with our whole heart, we stay in that light. If we fall into sin, darkness creeps in. Sin such as fear, worry, unforgiveness, gossip, judgment, pride. However, if we humble ourselves in repentance, we are restored back into the light. If we do not repent, the darkness grows. Our refusal to obey his commandment to repent gives the devil a foothold and the darkness will prevail. Only the mercy of God can bring us into the light again. The devil starts out planting his lies in your mind. He often, it's just a tiny thought or maybe even just a word. Then little by little he builds a case. We are not even aware he's talking to us. We actually think it's our own thoughts, but upon examination, we can identify his voice. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren, and that's his MO. He is always accusing someone or something. He will only say something is your fault if it's to his advantage. 
Not only can you distinguish between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the devil from the tone of their voices, but by the words that they speak. If you're in the word, you are familiar with the Holy Spirit's voice, for he speaks the word. The devil will be accusing you of falling short, failing those who love you, or throwing your sins up in your face. If the Holy Spirit wants to show you sin, he will do so lovingly, and he will remind you that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, just like the word says. However, your enemy will say things like, they, meaning your family, your friends, or your wife, or your coworkers, will be better off without you. Or even, they will miss you when you're gone. Who will they take advantage of? Or even, he might make it sound like they're your thoughts. Or maybe you've received a terminal diagnosis, and once you're gone, the pain will be gone. Or, and this is a really good one, I don't want to be a burden to anyone. These and my earlier questions are just a few examples of phrases the enemy will be whispering in your ear. You must remember he's a liar. That means he's lying to you when he puts those loud, never-ending, accusatory thoughts in your head. What you are hearing are the tormentors. He has them there to torture you, enough to cause you to take your own life. However, the torment does not end when the deed is done. In fact, it goes on nonstop for eternity. Your home will be in hell if you kill yourself. Hell will be your reward. The trials you're going through are trials which you must overcome. Revelation 3, 5 says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. This is really important. Listen to this. You do not overcome by quitting. In today's world, the devil has everyone believing that everyone goes to heaven no matter how they live their life. No one wants to talk about hell. I understand that believing your loved one is in heaven is much less painful than believing him to be in tormented for hell for eternity. God has given us life for a purpose, and many never realize what the purpose even is at the end. Our lives are like a race, and we are commanded by God to run the race, every obstacle that is set before us. Quitting is not an option. Only God is in control of when our race is over as he has numbered our days. Like any race, we don't win unless we follow the rules and run the course. If you quit the race before the finish line, you're playing God. In the Common English Bible, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 26a, don't you know that the runners in the stadium run, but only one gets the prize? So run to win. Everyone who competes practices self-discipline in everything. The runners do this to get a crown of leaves that shrivel up and die, but we do it to receive a crown that never dies. So now this is how I run, not without a clear goal in sight. In Hebrews 12, 1, the author says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I love what Westminster Catechism says. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Knowing him and obeying him and fearing him brings us joy. The life is hard because we live in a fallen world. What ple pleasures we do derive from our life are fleeting at best. However, we are promised eternal life with our Savior if we finish well. In Romans 8:18, 8, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering has a purpose that today's church doesn't want to acknowledge. Legal euthanasia has made killing yourself more palatable because people don't want their loved ones to suffer. Google lists it, lists it as death with dignity. However, no matter what you call it, it's murder. 
It's through suffering we become more like Christ. And I believe that God does his greatest perfecting of us during that time. Jesus suffered for our sins to provide our salvation. Why should we think we should be allowed to escape suffering? Why would we want to if it's for our own good? Here's some more information I found on the internet. Euthanasia is more commonly performed on sick and injured animals as euthanasia for humans is illegal in the majority of the United States. As of June 2021, the only jurisdictions in the U.S. that allow the procedure are Oregon, Washington, D.C., Hawaii, Washington, Maine, Colorado, New Jersey, California, and Vermont. As of 2022, euthanasia is legal in Belgium, Canada, Colombia, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Spain, and all six states of Australia. The End of Life Option Act allows California residents who are at least 18 years old and have a terminal illness with life expectancy of six months or less to request a medication that will hasten their death. I'm sure that in the upcoming years, euthanasia will be allowed everywhere here in the U.S. and broadened in criteria to include anyone who just wants to check out. I know should that happen, it will still be a sin to do so as God's word never changes. 1 Peter 5.10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a little while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. I could spend all day giving you scriptures of encouragement, but you need to read the Bible for yourself. Let him speak to you through his word. If you find yourself to be in a dark place, there is hope. Forgiveness and repentance are the key. You need to make a list of those who have hurt you and who you have hurt. James 5, 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When someone hurts you and you do not immediately forgive them, you sin. The longer you wait, the harder it is, and then you must not only forgive, but you must repent of that sin. From that time, Jesus begins to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew 4.17. A couple of weeks ago, I had a session with a woman who had something against her father and wanted to deal with it. In our conversation, she confessed she had been contemplating suicide, only she made it more palatable by calling it self-harm. It was an elaborate plan that if she had carried out would have cost taxpayers thousands of dollars, not to mention the toll it would have had on her family. I'm so thankful that God provided wise counsel for the woman. He gets all the glory. And this is not the first time I've encountered such desperation. Last month, I counseled another woman who was also considering taking her own life. I pointed out to her that it was a lie straight from the pit of hell that her troubles would end with such an act. They would have indeed continued for eternity should she have gone through with it. You want pain forever? Kill yourself. You want torment forever? Kill yourself. You want fear forever without end? Kill yourself. <clears throat> During my break in writing this message, I opened Facebook and the first post I saw was a report of another police officer's suicide. The final words of the post were RIP. Suicide needs leaves no peace for the one who commits the act or the ones left in its wake. I looked up some other statistics. It's alarming to see that suicide claims more law enforcement lives than felonious killings or accidental deaths in the line of duty. An officer involved in a high-stress event has 70% chance of suicide following the next incident if they do not seek any intervention. There's one suicide death in the U.S. every 11.5 minutes. Suicide is the third leading cause of death for 15 to 24 years. 24-year-old Americans. Ken taught on the fear of the Lord Sunday before last 
when you don't fear God, then killing yourself is not an issue, especially if you believe everyone goes to heaven. Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. They don't quote that very much, do they? Daniel 12, 2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. contempt. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Matthew 12, 36 through 37 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they will give an account of in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The devil knows this, and he will try and get you to say what he has whispered in your mind. Remember, not every thought is your own. When we speak our thoughts, even to no one, it gives them power. And the thoughts could just be mindless worrying regarding our kids. You could just be talking to yourself, expressing thoughts of fear of what a pain you might be uh, that you're experiencing. Such words are unbelief. Worry and fear show your unbelief in God's ability to provide for you and yours. Matthew 13, 58 says, And he did not many works because of their unbelief. Well, I've gotten you in trouble so far, and so now I'm going to get you out. I want to read something that Michael Bodea wrote on Monday, January the 16th. And you'll have to excuse me because every time I've read it, I've cried. As the story goes, back in the day when things were going from bad to worse in Austria, a father saw the writing on the wall and began making plans to move his son away. His wife had died in childbirth and his son was the only family he had left. The man was a wood carver by trade and for his eighth birthday, he carved a beautiful wooden horse for his son with wooden wheels and a string with which he could pull the toy beside him. Once the toy was finished, he also carved his initials in the horse's underbelly, small but noticeable, so that his son would know that it had been his handiwork. He was trying to sell his business when the whispers began that they were rounding up people up in Germany and other parts of the continent. One night, unable to wait any longer, the man took his son and their belongings and left in the middle of the night. In their haste, the boy didn't notice that his wooden horse was missing until they were already on the train on their way to France. The boy never knew whether it had fallen out of his bag or if he'd gotten, left it at home, forgotten it, but the toy was gone. Thirty years later, the boy, now a successful architect in Paris, returned to Austria for the first time since he'd left. He walked the streets of his old neighborhood, found the building he and his father once shared, sat in a cafe, drank some coffee. And then as he walked through the city, he happened upon a small market where vendors brought their wares to sell. There were silver spoons and fancy plates, smoking pipes and brass doorknobs, in a, art in a gilded frames and military uniforms. Then on a blanket on the ground, amidst trinkets and baubles, he saw a wooden horse. It was dirty, packed with grime, missing one ear, and cracked wheels, but that horse looked far too familiar to him. The young man asked to see it. And running his fingers across the wood, holding the toy gently, then turned it over and inspected the underbelly with all the focus he could muster. It was faded, almost invisible, but the initials were there. And as he ran his finger over them, he could feel the indentations. How much do you want for this, he asked in broken German. The old woman looked at the toy in his hand and said, five groschens, the equivalent of five cents. The young man pulled out his billfold and out of his coat pocket and began counting his money. 487 shillings, the young man said. It's all I have, will you take it? The old woman looked puzzled, then said, that's too much. I couldn't take your money, it's not worth that. It is to me, the young man answered, wiping tears from his eyes and handing the woman a stack of bills. Sorry. God chose to pay the price for your redemption 
without haggling, quibbling, asking for a better deal. He paid more for you than you thought you were worth on your best day, even though for most of us, our best days are so far in the rear view that there's nothing to see. He didn't wait until you went on sale or were in the clearance bin. He desired for you to be reconciled to him, that he watched as his only begotten son wore a crown of thorns, was flogged, hung on a cross, bled and died without intervening. God, for his part, Jesus endured his pain, the humiliation, the alienation, all the while knowing that more than 12 legions of anim- angels excuse me, were no more than a prayer away. They did all that for you because there was no other way. Overinflated egos being what they are, I'm sure there are individuals about who think God got a deal. He didn't. I know I can only speak for myself, but God did not get a deal when he redeemed me. Nevertheless, he did it, and for this I will forever be grateful. I keep coming back to this because it is such a powerful truth that far too many seem to overlook. You were only worth what he paid for you to God. Nobody knows how long that boy's wooden horse lay in the blanket. Week after week, month after month, thousands upon thousands of people may have passed it by, and none were willing to spend five cents for it. They saw no value in it. They saw no worth. Then the young man comes along, offers everything he has because to him it is priceless. It wasn't priceless because it was so exquisite. It was priceless because of who made it and the connection the young man had with it. Its value was derived from something other than the material it was made of or its execution in detail. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. There could be no reconciliation without redemption, nor could there be salvation without redemption. For you to be redeemed, a price needed to be paid. I've been accused of being overly passionate when it comes to men honoring God by the way they live. And if I have been, this is the reason for it. You were redeemed by the blood of God's Son. How dare anyone trifle with such a gracious gift? How dare anyone take it for granted or feel as though they were entitled to redemption? If I know I was purchased with a price, and the price I was purchased with far exceeded what I'm worth, how could I not love and serve my master? It costs God more than some of you choose to realize to redeem you from destruction. With love in Christ, Michael Bodea. And then I saw this that I wanted to also share. It was written by J.C. Ryle. He lived from 1816 to 1900, and it's called A Word of Invitation from either a sermon or a book, Old Paths, Our Souls. Here's an invitation to all who desire their souls to be saved. I invite every reader of this paper who feels the value of his soul and desire salvation to come to Christ without delay and be saved. I invite him to come to Christ by faith and commit his soul to him that he may be delivered from the guilt, the power, and the consequences of sin. My tongue is not able to tell, and my mind is too weak to explain the whole extent of God's love toward sinners and of Christ's willingness to receive and save souls. You mistake greatly if you doubt Christ's readiness to save. I know there are no obstacles between that and that soul of yours and eternal life except your own will. There is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repents, Luke 15.10. You may have heard something of the wonders of the chorus of at the Crystal Palace concerts, but what is it that burst of harmony in the Hallelujah Chorus to the outburst of joy which is heard in heaven when a soul turns from darkness to light? What is it all but a mere whisper compared to the joy of the angels over one sinner taught to see the folly of sin and to seek Christ? Oh, come and add to that joy without delay. If you love life, beseech you, I beseech you, to lay hold on Christ at once and that your soul may be saved. 
Why not do it today? Why not this day join yourself to the Lord Jesus in an everlasting covenant which cannot be broken? Why not resolve before tomorrow's sun dawns to turn from the services of sin and to turn to Christ? Why not go to Christ this very day and cast your soul on him with all its sins and all its unbelief, with all its doubts and all its fears? Are you poor? Seek treasure in heaven and be rich. Are you old? Hasten, hasten to be ready for your end and prepare to, prepare to meet your God. Are you young? Begin well and seek in Christ a never-ending, never-failing friend who will never forsake you. Are you in trouble? Careful about this life? Seek him who alone can help you and bear your burdens. Seek him who will never disappoint you. When others turn their backs on you, then Jesus Christ, will t the Lord, will take you up. Are you a sinner? a great sinner, a sinner of the worst description. It shall be remembered no more if you only come to Christ. His blood shall cleanse all sin away. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Go then and cry to the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of the value of your soul. Think of the one way of salvation. Call on the Lord in earnest prayer. Do as the penitent thief did. Pour out your heart before him. Cry, Lord, remember me, even me. Tell him you come to him because you have heard that he receives sinners and because you are a sinner and want to be saved. Tell him the whole story of your past life. Tell him, if you will, that you have been an unbeliever, a prolificate, a Sabbath breaker, a godless, reckless, ill-tempered man. He will not despise you. He will not cast you out. He will not turn his back on you. He never breaks the bruised reed or quenches the smoking flax. No man ever came to him and was cast out. Oh, come to Christ and your soul shall live. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Good. Thank you. You're free to move about the building. <laughs> Cabin, whatever. <laughs>